you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds and hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> So a while back, we were contacted by Christopher Muir and his mustache about helping him organize a course in Sweden. Our first thought was, Sweden? Hell yes. Uh, but then we realized we don't really have the time. Honestly, the wives are getting pretty sick of our travel, and we're trying to cut back a bit. But then he sent pictures. Seriously? This conference is ridiculous. It's held in a Japanese spa that looks absolutely amazing, and everyone wears these amazing Japanese robes all day. Now, I made a commitment to myself a long time ago that I would never say no to an ultrasound course where you only wear robes. So we were in. I don't want to let myself down. And I made a promise to myself that one day I would give an ultrasound talk while soaking my feet in a fish bath. But we had no idea just how awesome this course was going to become. It's all set now, and registrations are open. Vicki Noble, Brett Nelson, Beatrice Hoffman, Risa Lewis, Danielson Hoffman, Jarman Wood, and others are coming. Did we mention that everyone attending the conference is wearing robes? And fish nibble your feet? Actually, I have no idea what the heck that is, but it looks really interesting. So if you love ultrasound, robes, Japanese spas, and fish nibbling in your feet, then come see us in Sweden. We know that not everyone can make the trip across the pond to Castlefest, but hey, if we can meet up with you in Sweden for a little ultrasounding at a spa with some of the best ultrasonographers in the world, then why not? See you there, www.sonosweden.com. Hey everybody, Mike here. Welcome back to the Ultrasound Podcast. You've learned a lot so far this year during the Summer of the Resuscitationist. You learned a little bit about the fast exam from Cliff Reed, probably learned more than you ever wanted to know about volume responsiveness from Mike Stone and Scott Weingart. And you even learned a little bit about volume responsiveness from some Canadians, Jean-Francois and Maxime. But Matt and I are done with you yet. We still have some education left to share. To round out the summer of the resuscitationist on the Ultrasound Podcast, we want to talk to you a bit about a new hot area of critical care ultrasound, and that's fluid responsiveness. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, you've talked all summer about fluid responsiveness, but this is different, I swear. We're going to take it to a new, whole, exciting level. Now, we've talked about fluid responsiveness not only this summer, but before, but always in reference to cardiac echo. And you can feel free to go back to review podcast 22 and 23, where we first introduced this idea of the passive leg raise. When we talk about fluid responsiveness, we're usually referring to hypotensive patients and trying to determine if they will increase their stroke volume or cardiac output by 10% after you give them fluid bolus, and that's usually 500 cc's. Now this is a challenging question to answer in critical care, and it spawned pretty large debate, which we've spent a good bit of the summer talking about with Mike Stone and Scott Weingart. The most validated way of answering the question of fluid responsiveness in spontaneously breathing patients is by performing a cardiac output or stroke volume measurements before and after a fluid bolus of 500 cc's or a passive leg raise. Now this is well described in uh, podcast 22 and 23, and I don't wanna go back to it and spend a lot of time on it, but as many smart people have said, sometimes you have to spend your whole life doing cardiac echo to reliably get images needed to measure VTI. Now, I don't know if I agree with those statements, but I will admit that the VTI measurement can be pretty tough. If only there was a way to measure changes in stroke volume and cardiac output without getting that complicated echo window. If only. About a year ago, I was at AIUM and I met a guy named Alex Levitov. Alex is not only one of the smartest people I've ever met, He's also got a sweet Russian accent, which is pretty much my go-to impersonation. Some have said that I spent many years working on my Russian accent. Here's a short clip from Alex's talk at AIUM. Please excuse the poor audio quality. I swear, there's genius hidden behind all that fuzz. So we started looking at perhaps uh, seeing what will happen with, the, with these uh, passive leg raising. And the idea being that as you passively raise somebody's legs, uh, you encounter about uh, 500 cc. Wow, that is some horrible uh, audio. I just want to interrupt to make sure it's very clear that Dr. Levitov is in no way to blame for this. This is 110% Mike Malin's fault. So as you're straining to hear this, picture Mike when you're trying to get angry at someone for the pain your ears are going through. But also try to listen and understand. A genius, Dr. Levitov, is speaking. Bring Sterling curve, and uh, if it so, you are preload responsive, therefore. And if it doesn't, as in the lower graph, then you are uh, not. And in fact, I think the the key from this slide would be that uh, nobody is really not volume responsiveness because of the 
left ventricular function. So here you can see a miserable left ventricular function, but you can be volume responsive if you just move that uh, preload uh, with passive leg raising to the left. On the other hand, you can have an exceedingly good left ventricular function on this curve, but if you're here, you would not be volume responsive. So it kind of dissociates left ventricular function from volume responsiveness, which makes perfect sense. And of course, it would be nice to look at the aorta, and you can always say what the aortic flow goes if you have the integral of that, and it goes up uh, by 18%, by, uh, then you will likely respond to 500 cc of fluid by increasing your cardiac output to 10%. But to get images like this, you have to spend your entire life doing echoes. So we thought, well, it wouldn't be neat to do the same thing with a vessel that is very easily approachable. And we thought that it would be really cool to do it with a carotid artery. Why is it cool to do it with a carotid artery? Well, carotid artery comprises in its flow about one-eighth of the cardiac output and two of them, about 16 of the cardiac output. That has been demonstrated uh, quite extensively. And it seems a normal situation reflect uh, changes in cardiac output, of course it's right here. You can put a doctor in it in no time and obtain a very easy image, and that's why we palpated for such a long time, and that's why we palpated to assure ourselves uh, to the return of spontaneous circulation, just because it's very convenient. It would be tough to palpate the aorta. So that, that will be really cool, and we start doing that. Now, around this time in the talk, Matt looked something like this. And that's not to say anything about Dr. Levitov's ability to give an amazing talk, because he actually is a very engaging speaker, but we all know that Matt has a bit of the narco-sleepy that he just can't fend off sometimes. So I woke him up, and we had a little talk about how big a deal this was. I mean, seriously, if you could actually measure volume responsiveness without having to get any echo images, it would be so much easier. We could teach it to just about anybody, to medical students, to undergraduates. So Matt and I have been trying to figure out how to make this into a podcast for a little over a year now. We just didn't know where to take it. There really wasn't any literature out there to back up these claims. And as awesome as it sounded, we just wanted some definite literature saying, like, look, you can do this. You can apply this to critical patients. Luckily, Drs. Levitov and Merrick released this paper. Now, if you haven't read this and you're into critical care ultrasound, then you need to get your head out of that hole and give it a gander. This is a pretty impressive paper. Now, in this study, what they did was they looked at ICU patients who were undergoing a passive leg raise maneuver as part of their resuscitation protocol uh, and had a stroke volume increase by greater than 10%. So that's what they described as patients who were being volume responsive was a stroke volume index increase by 10%. And what they did is they found that the passive leg raise maneuver had a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 100%, which is pretty impressive. So they're basically saying if I just look at, you know, how accurate is the passive leg raise maneuver at determining who's volume responsive, it's pretty good, 94% and 100%. But what they also did was they applied the same technique to carotid blood flow measurements. And they found that the carotid blood flow with uh, patients who were volume responsive increased by 79% after a passive leg raise in a patient who was responsive. But in a patient who was non-responsive, there was virtually no increase in carotid blood flow, which tells me there's something here. And when using the cutoff of 20%, saying if your carotid blood flow increased by 20%, then you're fluid responsive, they actually found a sensitivity and specificity of 94% and 86%. That's pretty impressive. So let me go over that one more time. If your carotid blood flow increases by 20%, you're going to be a fluid responder. And that's a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 86%. Really pretty cool stuff. Okay, I got a bust in here. I was okay with going over these numbers, but then you got a little definitive on me. This was a study of 34 patients, and they derived these numbers from this small set of patients. So, small study, not repeated anywhere yet. Cool idea, but let's not get crazy excited yet. Maybe just a little, yay, but not quite a big. Quite yet. And just to review what we're talking about here with the passive leg raise, you're saying that the patient's in a semi-recumbent position. 
you measure the carotid blood flow at baseline. Then you perform a passive leg raise. So you lift their legs up, you flatten, the, flatten their torso, lift their legs up to 30, 45 degrees, leave them there for two minutes, repeat, repeat your carotid flow measurements. Now, a lot of people have said that instead of doing a passive leg raise, just give them an empiric fluid bolus and see if they Im improve. And if they do, you can probably give them another fluid bolus. So what you would do then is instead of actually uh, elevating their legs and doing a passive leg raise, you would just basically get your initial carotid fluid measurement give them 500 cc's, do your carotid flow measurement again, and see if it went up. This is what it looked like in their paper when the patient's carotid flow increased. So the image on the left is a patient before a passive leg raise maneuver. And you see that their, you see that their carotid flow over here is 388 milliliters per minute. And then they do a passive leg raise, and the carotid flow increases to 698 milliliters per minute. Pretty impressive increase in carotid flow. And really, you can almost see it visually, and they have very significant increase, and that's a solid component of the carotid flow. So here's the results table from their paper. And the thing I want to point out here is that the patient's initial stroke volume index was uh, about equal, 25 in the responders, 31 in the non-responders, and definitely non-significant uh, difference between the stroke volume index. And what's important here is that the carotid flow increased by 79% in those patients who are responders and zero in patients who are non-responders. So I know what you're asking. You're asking, how do I do this? And that's where Austin and Jared come in. Austin Gross is an ultrasound fellow from the University of Arizona from last year, and Jared Mosier is going to be manning the camera. They're going to teach us a thing or two about how to measure carotid VTI and carotid flow. Take it away, guys. Hey guys, we're going to teach you guys today how to measure cerebral blood flow by looking at the um, blood flow in the common carotid artery. Um, what we're measuring is called the common carotid artery VTI. Basically, all you have to do is find the common, co common carotid artery in the long axis and measure the diameter, and then also put pulse wave Doppler in that same area and measure the flow. So we'll show you guys how to do that, and it's just two simple steps. Measure the diameter and measure the flow with pulse wave Doppler. First step is going to be to take your linear probe and find the common carotid artery. So the easiest way to do that is to first get your short axis view. You can optimize your settings by hitting the eye touch button and twisting the button to get your gain. Here's your internal jugular vein and your common carotid artery. What we're going to do is scan up the common carotid artery until we see it get bigger, that's the carotid bulb, and you see it bifurcate into the internal and external carotid. Come back down to the common carotid artery, that's where we want to measure, and we're going to switch to the long axis on that common carotid artery. The idea is to get the artery in its long axis view so that you can still see the carotid bulb, which we have right here. You can see this nice common carotid artery, and then right here where it gets slightly wider, that is the carotid bulb. Once we've found that, what you want to do is, that, is measure the diameter in systole. So I'm going to get my nice picture of the common carotid artery and hit the freeze button here on the screen. Then I can scroll back through the images and try to find a nice clean picture. So the first step is to get the common carotid artery in long axis, to scroll back, and then we want you to scroll back until the artery is at its widest diameter, meaning systole. So there you can see it going into diastole, so I'll scroll here until it's at its widest diameter in systole. Next, you're going to measure within one centimeter of the carotid bulb. So anywhere in this area, you're going to measure the diameter. And you're going to measure from intima to intima. The intima is that thin line you can see on the inside of the common carotid artery. So I hit my measure button. I'm going to go right here, definitely within one centimeter. And I'll measure the diameter straight across. 0 0.62 centimeters. And I'll go ahead and save that image by hitting the save or pick button here. All right, so that's the first step out of this simple two-step process. All right, now that we've got our diameter of the common carotid artery just proximal to the carotid bulb, we're going to go on and, and measure the, the blood flow in that area, which is called VTI. And to do that, we're going to use pulse wave Doppler. So I'm going to go back and try to get the same image that I just had, that of the common carotid artery in its long axis. You need to tweak the probe back and forth so you get the cleanest picture possible of that common carotid artery and carotid bulb. Remember, if you get lost, you can always go back to short axis. So here I have that nice view again, common carotid artery. There's the carotid bulb. And when I'm happy with my view, what I'm going to do is hit the pulse wave Doppler button. And I want to try to put that about the same distance from the carotid bulb that I took my diameter measurement. Right, so that the gate's in the center of the vessel. Next thing I'm going to do 
is hit the steer button, which is this top soft key, so that that center line in the gate is as close to parallel with the direction of blood flow as possible. As, I, as you can see right here, that's actually pretty close to parallel. Now all I have to do once, I, once I'm happy with my settings is hit the update button, and I'm going to see the pulse wave Doppler tracing of the common carotid artery. We'll let that go for a second, and then we'll hit the freeze button. The machine is automatically calculating the area under the curve for three beats and giving you a number called VTI, which is velocity time integral. Basically, it's measuring the area under the curve and giving you that and giving you uh, velocity over one beat so that we can calculate blood flow. All right, guys. Just to summarize, there's two simple steps to calculate the carotid blood flow. Step one is measuring the diameter of the common carotid artery in the long axis. To do that, we find the common carotid artery so that we can see the carotid bulb, which is the small, sorry, the dilation right before it bifurcates. Within about one centimeter we're gonna, of the bulb, we're going to measure the diameter from intima to intima. That will give us our diameter. Then in that same area of the common carotid artery, we're going to put the pulse wave Doppler gate and steer that so that the line in the center of the gate is as close to parallel as blood flow as possible. When you're happy with your settings, you will hit the update button and you'll see a spectral tracing from the pulse wave Doppler of blood flow in the common carotid artery and the machine will automatically calculate flow. A special thanks to Rich Amini, ultrasound faculty at Arizona, for tipping us off to this study and answering all the questions we had and getting us this video. And to Shrikar Adhikari out there in Arizona for leading this crazy awesome group of ultrasound folks. That was excellent. Let's do a quick review. So step one, we're going to get the carotid and long axis. And to do that, I'm going to have the probe marker pointed up towards the patient's head. I'm going to be looking for the carotid and specifically looking for that carotid bulb. So here's an example of the carotid artery. We have the probe marker up towards the patient's head. So head is this way, feet are this way. We see the beginnings of the carotid bulb right here and actually the bifurcation into the uh, external and the internal carotid. So what I want to do is look for that area about one centimeter back from the carotid bulb, and that's where we're going to be measuring the diameter of the carotid. So step two, measure the diameter. What we want to do is we want to go back about one centimeter from the carotid bulb, and we want to measure from intima to intima, and that's going to be our carotid diameter that we're going to use for this equation. Next, we're going to want to measure the VTI. Now to do that, all I have to do is hit pulse wave Doppler. I'm going to put the pulse wave gate in the actual carotid at the same level that I measured the diameter of the carotid, the common carotid that is, and we're going to make sure that the actual angle of flow is directed about the same as the direction of flow. And to do that, we're just going to change that angle, and that's that little line. Just about every one of these machines is going to have one of those, okay? And that's going to give us this tracing here, where we have systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic components. And then we're going to measure the VTI of three of those. Once we have the VTI averaged out, we're going to say that our carotid flow is equal to pi times the carotid diameter squared divided by 4 times VTI times heart rate. And that's going to give us the flow in milliliters per minute going through the carotid artery. Awesome. So this sounds like a really useful technique. If only there was someone who could give us some clinical context and teach us how to clinically apply this information. If only. Stop. Seriously? You're going to try to throw the long queen at me after those intense 15 minutes? No. I need a little time to digest this material and go practice this on some patients or some unsuspecting med students. We'll come back at you with the long queen and with a different take on carotid flow. Specifically, flow time, not flow velocity. I'm not sure about you, but that calculation they were doing still seems slightly intense if your machine doesn't do it for you. The flow stuff we'll talk about next time will be arguably even simpler. But before we go, if you haven't heard, you can now view iBooks on your Mac with the new operating system, Maverick. It's a free update in the Mac App Store and it makes iBooks viewable on the computer. It's pretty awesome. After just a quick three years of this ridiculous arbitrariness of them not allowing you to view iBooks on your computer, now you can. So if you have Introduction to Bethesda Sound Volume 1 or 2, download them on your computer as well now. It's pretty cool. And again, apply for the FOMED scholarship if you've got an idea for a project and need a little financial help. That application is still on the website. So see you soon back here with some carotid flow and see you at Smack, Castlefest, or Sweden. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it.